some story and some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. And good evening. Good to see each and every one of you out. Let's let's look to the Lord. Father, we do thank you for tonight, Lord. Always thankful for the opportunity uh, to come together with brothers and sisters. We're thankful for Sunday night. Always a special time, just a sweet time. We kind of see this as a as a family time, Lord. Uh, but we're here uh, to be in a preaching meeting and everything that takes place. Uh, uh, points to you, Lord. And so uh, in our singing, in our worship, in all that we do, we want to be a blessing to you. But uh, we come to hear from you tonight, Lord, and uh, we look forward to what you have for each and every one of us. And Lord, we just pray your continued blessing uh, on this meeting right now. We pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. amen. Let's all be seated. Good to see each and every one of you uh, for sure. Uh, we're going to be able to quickly move right into more of the service. I just want to share again, uh, right around the corner, we are going to have a men's uh, fellowship lunch. And the way this works is, after the morning service, this will be March 3rd. Um, did I got that right? Yes, March 3rd. Uh, we will uh, hop in our vehicles and go over to 10th Street. We call that Logan South over there. And uh, we get in the little back room over there and we just order off the menu and just have a good time of fellowship, men. Want to encourage you to come on out and be a part of that. If you've never done it before, I sure hope for you to be there. Uh, folks that have been with us for a long time and folks that are new with us, we really want you to come out. And men, those of you who have done this and do this on a regular basis, encourage others uh, to come on out. Want to encourage uh, uh, our deacons to be there. Some folks don't even know who our deacons are. I guess that's good. If you're, it must mean you're not in trouble. I don't know, but that's a good thing. Uh, well, actually, I think it's a better, a better thing to know each other. Amen. It really is a good way to for guys to get together in fellowship, and so I want to encourage you to be out for that. Amen. And continue to pray for Operation Go. That is uh, our soul winning uh, ministry where folks are being trained and equipped, studying the Word of God and sharing the gospel. Uh, they started last week. Uh, many souls saved, and we're thankful for uh, Brother Gilbert Martinez uh, leading that up, and we'll look forward to what the Lord's going to do. Amen? Let's continue with the service. Turn, if you would, please, in your hymnals to hymn number 542. 542, when we all get to heaven. Oh, oh, oh. 
Stand, if you would, for the offering, and turn on your hymnals to hymn number 210. 210. Jesus paid it all.
Amen. Amen. Hey, Brother Jaime, why don't you hand that over to you guys? Are you, did you guys call each other up? I mean, you're totally matching. I mean, good job. Amen. Brother, would you look to the Lord for us, Brother Roy? Dear Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you, Lord, for your mercy for us, Father God. Thank you for bringing us back again this evening. Thank you for the morning service. Thank you for the blessing that you uh, gave me this morning, Father. Mm. And I just ask you to just uh, continue to bless Maranatha Baptist Church, Father. Uh, Lord, uh, the leadership here at the church, Father. Lord, just thank you for Pastor Miller, Pastor Will. Lord, continue to bless their families, Father God. Lord, I just ask you for this offering, uh, Father. Bless the ones that can give and bless the ones that came, Father. Yes. We ask you all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Thank you very much, ladies. What a blessing. And that includes our piano player. We appreciate you. I was going to say we appreciate you guys. Don't take that wrong. That's just a California thing. So just live with it. Amen. But we do appreciate. How about this? Y'all. Would that work? This is supposed to be the South. This is about as far South as you can get. So let's say uh, thank you to these folks for sure. What a blessing they are. And uh, Brother Roy, I saw you over there working on that air conditioning. I want to make sure it was knocked down a couple of notches because it seemed a little warm in here. Anybody agree with me? Anybody disagree? Hey, I thought I was going to see if we had a church split, but we are okay on that. Amen. But uh, just let me just say, uh, when I start feeling a little bit warm, I know that it's getting a little warm in here. I would invite you to turn in your Bibles tonight to Matthew. Hey, listen, we've been in Matthew for all three services. Anybody remember what chapter we were in in Sunday school? Anybody? Anybody? Twenty-four, Matthew twenty-four. All right, good job. And how about the uh, Sunday morning service, chapter five? Very. You guys are tremendous, amazing Bible students. And so tonight, how about what chapter are we in? Did some of you say sixteen? Well, the reason you did is because you got my outline too early because I made a mistake. If you have, if it says scripture reading chapter sixteen. Uh, you've got the wrong outline. You don't have to jump up and change it. Just know it's actually chapter 17. Chapter 17. That's what the new ones say back there. And so, uh, you know what? I want to encourage you to use these outlines. Um, Brother Jaime is up right there if you need one. Anybody need one? Or if you got the wrong one, you want the right one. Um, you know, we, we, uh, we just like to change things up around here just a little bit. No, actually a lot. And so uh, that's where we're at. Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. And uh, it does feel like it's getting a little bit cooler in here. Thank the Lord. I came in here actually, um, you know, between services and you could have hung meat in here. I'll tell you what. It's sure. It's sure. That's what happens when you've got an air conditioning guy who's part of your church. Amen. I mean, that's what that must have been all about. Actually, it has to do with the fact that it was down to about 72 or something like that. And it does cool down in here. And so I knocked it up a little bit. So uh, we'll find that happy medium. Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17. Let's begin with verse 14. And when they were come to the multitude... There came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic. Now, how many could agree with that? I mean, anybody, uh, can you feel that verse right there? <laughs> Let's move on. Amen. I'm going to start with verse 15 again. Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is Lunatic. I added the A. It just felt like it worked better. Uh, and sore vexed, for oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. We had fun for just a moment, but really, this is a very serious issue. There's no doubt. And notice verse 16. And I fought him to, I'm sorry, and I brought him to thy disciples. And they could not cure him. Now that's an important passage that we want to focus on tonight. Notice verse 17. Then Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation. Nothing like watered down preaching, amen? Notice, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? In the 21st century vernacular, that would be, how long shall I put up with you? Amen. Bring him hither to me. And you know, just the language here, I think that Jesus was very stern at this time, don't you? And Jesus rebuked the devil, and he departed out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart. That's the way we often do it, <laughs> kind of in secret. 
and said, why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall be, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Howbeit, this kind goeth out, but by prayer and fasting. May I just ask this question? Do you think this is hyperbolic language? I don't. I believe exactly what the Lord says. That the, and you know, we're familiar, every preacher and every Christian is sent under preaching where we've preached on the mustard seed and faith. But we want to make sure we tune into what is taking place before that very wonderful, that very popular verse, uh, verse 17. I want, to, I want to just say without apology that this is not some type of an expression to drive home a point. This is the truth. This is the truth. We can have mountain-moving faith. Now, somebody might have had a lot of faith down here in the uh, Rio Grande Valley because I can't find a mountain anywhere. You notice that? I mean, people say, welcome to the valley. And I look around and I go, how is this a valley? Don't you have to have mountains around it? Well, I guess they're talking about the, you know, the Sahara Nevada over on the West Coast. I don't know because they're not right here. But the real truth is we just got to no, and we got to understand and believe that it really is true. God is in the miracle business, and He'll, and and I'm not talking about you know you putting on a white suit and opening up an arena and going over there and putting on some kind of a magic show and trying to get yourself rich. By the way, there's a lot who have. I'm talking about exercising real faith. Do you pray, uh, believing? Do you, you know, I mean, don't we all uh, find ourselves, sometimes we say all the right things and we might even pray the right way and we might even be counseling with somebody or dealing with somebody uh, and we might just suppose, well, this seems like what possibly will happen and this over here is going to make more sense. Hey, listen, we've got to get back to believing that God does miracles, I mean, there's no doubt about it. And, and he's talking to some serious folks who know what it means to serve the Lord, who know what it means to walk with the Lord and want to be used by the Lord. So this says to me, for each and every one of us born-again Christians, whether you have been saved for a week or two or three or a few years or you are serving and you have, in fact, been serving for a number of years, listen carefully. We've got to believe this passage of Scripture. We've got to believe with all our heart that this is true. How in the world do we ever think big things are going to get done for the Lord if we have small prayers and we think in small ways when it comes to what the Lord wants to do? You know, I'll tell you, I think we got to be very careful when somebody says, I believe that the Lord is going to cure my cancer. And then a Christian comes along and says, yeah, but you know, you better be careful about that because you don't want to be disappointed. And you know, that. hey, listen, we better get back to preaching this book and exercising real faith. You know, when the Lord raises up ministries, we don't say, well, Lord, would you please raise up this ministry in a very you know, normal, practical way uh, that obviously as we've looked at the demographics and considered all the possibilities, it'll all go together. No, do a miracle. Do a miracle, amen? And we sure do see this here. We see somebody who believes in miracles and we see some who are learning a lot when it comes to what God can do. And uh, let's... Think about this a little bit tonight and work together as the Lord shows us, I think, some real important truth for, for us, for you and I as, as born-again Christians, as men and women who want to serve the Lord, who want to be 
used by the Lord. Amen? So notice with me. Number one, the malady of mountains. The malady of mountains. The man with the epileptic son had a mountain in his life. There's a message right there. How about it? Do you have a mountain in your life? Have you ever had someone appeal to you for the Lord to work because they have a mountain in their life? Watching the boy suffer his, uh, I mean, think about it. It was heart-wrenching. And caring for him around the clock, I can tell you, must have been difficult. I have right here in this group, I know for sure, people who have uh, special needs children, who have cared for children. Uh, we have others who maybe even were given the responsibility to care for an ailing uh, family member, maybe a parent. I know my children are, are, are totally devastated that the idea that someday they might be caring for me, I just keep on reminding them. I might be sitting on the front porch someday, you know, and that's just, especially my daughter-in-law, Jenny Miller, it just kind of scares her to death, but that's okay, amen? But really, we know what it's like. We know how difficult it must be for this one here. This is a real person. I mean, uh, caring for his child, doing all the things that he needs to do. So what happens? The father desired for someone to remove his mountain. You know, real, real opportunity for ministry comes this way. When we're out visiting with folks and just inviting people to church, you want to know how many mountains we run into? I mean, I said there weren't any in the valley. There are on the streets. We often have somebody say, I just lost my father. Or my son is into drugs or whatever the case may be. It's amazing how they may not know us or have never met us. And they're willing to open up their heart and say, I have got a mountain. Now, we know the biggest mountain of all is sin. The biggest mountain of all is not knowing Jesus Christ is your Savior. And you want to move that mountain? I'll tell you how you move that mountain. You share the gospel and watch that mountain be moved, amen? If, in fact, we believe what the Bible has to say about salvation, and we do, why in the world would we not believe everything else that the Bible has to say about moving mountains? Our difficulties may be of a different variety, but we have mountains, and we Minister to people who have mountains. Let's begin with inward difficulties. Many people have inward difficulties such as guilt. See if any of us can relate to this. Anxiety. Some of us have anxiety about our anxiety. Amen. Depression. Depression is real. I think we can turn to several passages where we see Depression expressed. And be careful when you say, well, you're just uh, one without a lot of faith and that's why you're having to... Hey, listen, you better be careful about that because you just named a whole lot of people in the Bible. Frustration. Other than driving through this valley, do you know what frustration feels like? Have you, have you exercised, well what a lot of us Christians exercise, and that is the Christian way to be frustrated when somebody won't get out of your way. Oh, bless your heart. Beep, beep, beep. You know, I mean, frustration. You know what? Can I, can I just tell you? Ministry becomes real when we recognize real people with real lives have real problems. And when we read our Bible, we're reminded that that's ex in, in fact exactly what is recorded here for us. Real people going through real difficulties and we see real answers. So we can all appreciate inward difficulties and we can appreciate wanting this mountain to be removed. We've all been there. We all know that. But you know what? Those are inward mountains that we just mentioned. But how about outward mountains? Maladies come from outside sources. Often people have to care for a loved one 
who has a disability or illness, just as we mentioned a moment ago. And for some of us, maybe we're already appreciating that 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 might fall upon us someday. And maybe for some of us, it will come upon us as a surprise. Some have difficulties with their family. Uh, Some have difficulties with work relationships. You know and I know that there are there are issues and concerns and, and, and things happening in our life that, that we really don't have any control over, but they're mountains for sure. I mean, some are victims of mistakes. I got my hand up. You want to know who? I, I'm one of the chief mistake makers for sure. You know, I'm still surprised that my kids are still alive, just to tell you the truth. How in the world did they make it past 13? I don't know. And really, the truth is, I don't know how I made it past 13. <laughs> because when we were running around back in the <clears throat> 60s or something like that, uh, you know, we ran down the street. We, ran, we, we swam in canals. We did all everything. everything in, we rode on the back of pickups, and we're still alive. We sure didn't know what a helmet was when you rode a bicycle. I mean, we didn't have those things. How about foolishness? You know what? Sometimes I think mistakes and foolishness kind of go together. And how about, and this is real, this is just, I mean, a moment of real reality. How about violence of others? Now, you know, the big uh, catch word now is, you know, being bullied. Well, I can tell you, some of us know what real violence is all about. We have suffered violence. Maybe we've grown up in a violent home or have been exposed to violence. It's one of those best kept secrets in some Christian homes. So many are hurt, there's no doubt. We think of harsh words or cruel deeds. I mean, there are malicious people out there in the world. We know that we can't protect our children from everything. Uh, we're not protected from everything. And when we, and, and you know, you can't stick them in a box and, and hide them. You know what they say the best thing to do with a, with a teenager when they turn 13 is, is to put them in a barrel and cut a little hole. And then cover the hole. And then about 19 or 20, open the barrel back up and let it back out. No, you can't do that. The real truth is, there are always going to be mountains. And you know what? Some people don't like to even hear that. Preacher, don't say that. I want to know when you get saved that everything's just going to always be perfect. Hey, how many people found out in about five seconds after they got saved that that, in fact, isn't the case? Amen? Hey, listen. There will always be mountains. As a matter of fact, the more you're doing for the Lord, the more Satan is going to raise up every kind of mountain he can for you to trip over. And so please notice with me, secondly tonight, mistakes in mountain moving. There were some real mistakes here, no doubt. The disciples made a mistake in seeking to remove the mountain. They didn't make a mistake in thinking that it's something that they could do. They they tried to do it with human strength. There is where the problem lies. And may I say for all of us today, we're all in ministry and you know and I know. And, and sometimes we got to be careful not to just say this, but to know this. We can't do this work in human strength. We'll, we'll fail. I guarantee you. Now, maybe for a little while things will ride and it'll seem okay. But I can tell you for sure, we've got to be careful. We make mistakes in moving our mountains by trusting our intellect, our, our wisdom. God has given us these things, but we need to be looking to him and trusting him. Notice, escape the mountain. Some look at difficulties that face them and they try to escape. Now, this isn't new, but it just seems like it's easier to do. 
People try to escape today through, I mean, every diversion in the world that you can think of. Drugs, alcohol. <laughs> Since we've made everything legal, it's sure made it a lot easier, that's for sure. I think the only thing that's illegal is to take maybe aspirin. I don't know. Other than that, do whatever you want. And of course we know sex outside of the sanctity of marriage, gambling. If we were to attach numbers and dollars to what we're describing here, we're talking about what's really killing us. And you know what? After this is all said and done, this is not new, but it's, it seems like through the internet and, and you know, now you've got a phone, you're walking around and you can, you can watch anything you want on it, you can buy anything you want on it, you can, every, every temptation that you have is, is available to you. Did you know that pornography is a multi-billion dollar enterprise? I mean, I'm talking about billion with a big B. And all of these areas are areas where we struggle. You say, oh, you're talking to the world. No, I, I'm talking to born-again Christians. I'm talking to men and women of the Lord, of, of God. And I'm talking about folks that are, have been saved and are serving. I'm talking about missionaries and pastors all need to know that these are areas. This is usually what brings you down. You know, it isn't necessarily, it isn't very often that it's, that it's a doctrinal issue that, that, that shuts down a ministry. It's that we succumb to these difficulties. And, and, and let's call it what it is. It's called sin. And before you go pointing your finger at everybody else, you better know that, hey, listen, Satan desires to have you. He can't, he can't rob you of your salvation, but he can render you absolutely worthless, useless. And so we need to escape. We need to, God has made a way of escape. And we know that, we've read it, we know it, we quote it, but we need to do it. We need to do it. And do this, magnify the mountain. What do I mean by that? Often people look at some personal difficulty and they make too big of a mountain out of it. It really is true. I mean, the real truth is, often small, petty problems can be blown out of proportion. And you know what you can do? You can make yourself absolutely sick about something that never even happens. Well, I just know it's going to go this way. Oh, my. I've mentioned this before, but when we were missionaries on the Ak Chin Indian Reservation, uh, we had a senior missionary, and, and God bless Buddy and his family. They were such a blessing. He's in glory now, and so is his wife. And he is a true man of God, but he had this one saying. Anybody remember? I've mentioned it before. He said, bad things happen in threes. Yeah. I mean, nothing like a Christian having that, uh, that opinion, right? And so you want to know what it was like? Here we are, we're out there serving, and, and something would happen, and you go, that's one. And I'm already thinking, oh, man. I mean, buddy, why did you say that? Because I know what I'm looking for. I'm looking for two. I'm looking for two. And by the time the, the third is right around the corner, I'm just, uh, you know, I'm, I'm tripping over myself and, and finding myself agonizing over something that, guess what, may not ever even happen. You know, we agonize over what somebody might think, what somebody might say, what somebody might do. <laughs> That's magnifying the mountain. I don't know about you, but last time I checked, I got plenty on my plate to deal with without coming up with extra, amen? Amen. That's why some people think, Pastor, do you go looking around trying to find something wrong with people? I thought, are you kidding me? I mean, really? I mean, do you not know that, that there's enough to do just as we love one another and encourage one another? <laughs> I love what one great preacher said a long, long time ago. He said, listen, folks, 
if, if you really, really knew me, I mean, really knew me, you wouldn't listen to a thing that I have to say. He's talking, he's a, he was a preacher, he's in heaven also. Everybody's in heaven. Hey, when you get to that point, you know where you're at, amen? And he also said, but let me just say this, if I really, really, I mean, really, really, really knew you, I wouldn't waste my time trying to tell you anything, amen? I mean, that's kind of the way it is. We've got to be careful not to, and you know what, maybe even right now, are you making a mountain out of some kind of a little molehill? Are you making something into something that it's not? Hey, it may will it may be sometime, and it could be soon, who knows? But are you making yourself sick over it? Are you making wrong decisions because of it? Are you not trusting the Lord in it? Are you not seeing and believing that the Lord is allowing you to go through this? I mean, I got to tell you, some people think that they, you know, the, uh, you know, the older you get, the more, you know, capable you are of just handling all these issues. Let me just tell you something, folks. Newsflash, and there's a few folks I know will agree with me. Getting old is not for wimps, amen? I'm telling you, it's not for wimps. It's not easy. There will always be mountains. There will always be mountains. So we sure don't need to make mountains out of something that's not a mountain. And here you go. Climb the mountain. Climb the mountain. We make a mistake when we try to master our difficulties with human strength. You know the old... Does anybody say macho anymore? Everybody that's my age or older just went like this. The rest of them went like, <laughs> hey, listen. You know the old, I got this. Hey, look, we're good. I, I'm good. I got this. You know what? I, you know how many people shake my hand and say, and I say, how you doing? Oh, man, I'm telling you what, things are great. We got it. We're on, we're, we got it all figured out. At least they look that way on Facebook. I mean, you know, right? How many of you have already know? We, you know, we see the most darling, beautiful, wonderful folks, and then we hear they're getting a divorce. Well, you don't got this. The problem is the I part of got this. We try to master our problems. We try to fix things. And we do, and our default is that we go to ourselves in our own strength rather than go to the Lord in the first place. You want to know how to, uh, how for a molehill never to become a mountain? Go to the Lord first, right? I mean, go to the Lord. We cannot deal with the burdens of life without the Lord's help. I mean, it really is true. And this isn't new. I know it really isn't. And you know how it is. Lots of times we know what to think or what to say or what we think we ought to say or, or what we think we ought to tell somebody else. But this is for me first, for you, for all of us. And so thirdly tonight, this will be the last 45 minutes of the message. Thirdly, master of mountains, a mastery of mountains. The man mastered his difficulty when he went to Jesus. Man, you talk about exercising real faith. You just read the language here, and it is powerful. I mean, the Lord healed the boy, and then what did he do? What did he do? He rebuked the disciples for what? Their lack of faith. You know, I mean, if I were the Lord... I probably would have walked up and said, hey, that's okay, guys. <laughs> you tried. Good try, buddy. <laughs> he didn't, did he? He said, and I'll use the, the new translation, y'all don't have any faith, right? He said it. He said it. So notice, 
What is it that we're to take away from this? I mean, why was this included in all this? Hey, we're, we're all about seeing the Lord touch lives and change lives and do miracles. But I can show for you where, yes, God has used men and women just like you to see miracles done. The Lord's the one who's doing the miracle, but there are things that we're doing right when miracles take place. May I say, first and foremost, it begins with a relationship with the Lord. And I'm not just talking about knowing the Lord. I'm not talking about the most important decision you'll ever make. And that, of course, is trusting Christ as your Savior. I'm talking about an ongoing, growing, walk in relationship with the Lord. And yes, it even is true that somebody who's not walking with the Lord, maybe even as close to the Lord as you are to the Lord, we might see big things happen. And that right there is enough to shut us down. And we begin to be useless because we get an attitude over that. Because we think we're supposed to figure that out. You know, it's kind of like when I taught junior high school. I thought when I taught junior high school Bible at our Christian school that they were just going to fall over and be in love with me. You know, they didn't like me any more than the math teacher or the science teacher. Because I'm going to tell you what, when you're in junior high, nope, nothing's fair. <laughs> I mean, that's just the way it is. Every time you said, well, you have this assignment or that assignment, they say, well, Pastor Miller, that's not fair. That's not right. And we get the same attitude, don't we? We act the same way. You know what? We need to have a growing relationship with the Lord. The mastery of difficulties begins with a relationship with Jesus Christ. Yes, trusting him as your Savior. And then, yes, to grow in your walk and relationship. And you know, can I just say, we need to be careful to somehow think our worth is attached to our relationship with the Lord. And what's amazing about the Lord is He loves me even when I'm worthless. But I'm not better or special or important or have more worth than someone else. And you, how many of us have seen that? Someone's relationship is right, but then they begin to get high and mighty and cocky and, and think that they're somebody, they're, they're thinking too highly of themselves. And then when sin begins to sink in and we see all kinds of issues, and didn't we see this with, with the disciples of Christ? We saw this with the apostles where they were, where they were fighting over who ought to get more notoriety. And then finally, please notice a continued expression of faith. Amen? Faith does not always remove the obstacles or difficulties. I want us to stop and think about this. God is in the business of moving mountains, but he won't always do it necessarily the way we think he's going to get it done. I mean, that's just the truth. And we've got to be careful that when we gave marching orders to God and told him how this is all laid out and how it ought to go, that we don't find ourselves uh, disappointed because guess what? Newsflash, we have obstacles and difficulties in our lives still. That's called living. And you know, sometimes we get in the way of the Lord getting ready to do an even bigger miracle. I'm telling you. Well, hey, listen, Lord, I just asked for this, and that's what I expected, and it didn't go that way. So, therefore, I don't know, something's wrong here. Whatever situation or difficulty a Christian faces, it can be mastered by an openness to the Lord. What do we say? We need to communicate. How do we communicate with the Lord? We spend time with him. We, we, we're not looking for some flowery uh, message that'll impress the Pope. Who cares about that? What we're worried about is not being honest with the Lord. Not talking about what our problems really are. You know, the worst thing in the world is to waste the Lord's time by showing up and saying, okay, we're going to have a quick word of prayer, Lord, and I got this. <laughs> I'm just praying because it's the thing I'm supposed to do. No, no, no. Be open, be honest with the Lord. No. And, and tell him. Tell him when you're tell him when you're feeling anxiety, when you're when you're not sure what the next step is. He knows what the next step is. 
The man with an epileptic son met an unusual person in Jesus Christ. He met the mountain mover. And he knew it. He knew it. Whatever my difficulty is, whatever your difficulty is, you can relate to the mountain mover. You know what? We're to bear one another's burdens. We're to encourage one another, pray for one another. But when it comes to moving mountains, go to the original source. Go to the one who moves mountains. Trust him, trust him. And then even when it doesn't go the way you thought it was going to go or should go, trust him. Continue to trust him. And you know, I'm saying this, and this is what happens when you happen to pastor a church. I have said this to people who have just lost a loved one. I have, I've had this kind of counsel with folks who, who are going through financial difficulty or going through uh, some type of a family catastrophe. And you know what? We, we might say, well, that's good and fine. I'm good right now. We don't know about tomorrow. You know, if, if, if our faith and our walk and our trust is dependent upon our circumstances, we are all in big trouble, aren't we? I mean, we really are. We really are. We want to just believe the Lord. We want to trust Him. And, we, and, and this is why we've been going through this series, great truths about Christ that make a real difference. You know this scripture. I know this scripture. But I wanted to plant ourselves and be those who maybe because we weren't where we needed to be, weren't be able to, we weren't able to be used by the Lord the way He would want to use us. And don't be running off and looking for this fault in someone else. We got enough work to do to examine our own hearts tonight. Amen? Let's all stand. Our precious Lord and Heavenly Father, we, we come to you, Lord. We come to the mountain mover. How about it right now? What's that mountain in your life? What, what mountain is it that maybe has been in your life for even many years? What about someone who has come to you and they've pleaded with you and they've asked, why doesn't the Lord remove this mountain? What do you say? What do you do? Let's take a moment and let the Lord speak to us. Let the Lord have his way. Simply put, we're going to trust you, Lord. You're the mountain mover. And however you move a mountain and why you move a mountain and what you might do, we're going to look to you and trust you and thank you in it. And let's be careful about some of us who think we've got to call the shots and, and, and it's got to be our way or no way. No, it needs to be the Lord's way. Have your way tonight, Lord, with us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.